Let's open our Bibles to um, the first epistle, uh, general epistle of John, 1 John. And it was written by John the Apostle. John the Apostle lived longer than all the other apostles. He lived into his 80s, perhaps 90s. Uh, well, 90s, yeah. He was the last one to die. He was the only one that was not martyred for Christ. And they actually boiled him in oil once, but that wasn't a take either. So uh, he wrote the Gospel of John in the years around 85 to 90 A.D. That's with no numbers in front of the 85 and 90. Uh, first, second, and third John uh, between the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation, which he also wrote. Revelation he wrote in about the year 96. So at the time of this epistle here, this letter, it's about 55 to 60 years since Jesus' crucifixion. I'll read the first two verses. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was, man and was manifested unto us. A uh, little background here. This letter, the theme here is it's an intimate letter from the Father is the idea here to his little children who were in the world. And we are God's children. We're part of the family. Uh, even though we may look older in one another's eyes, we're all kids in God's eyes. And uh, so to all his little children who are here in this world, not of the world, but in the world, and we're, we're con this uh this epistle, it's considered to be one of the most in, intimate of all of his inspired writings. And uh, the sins of believers are, are treated as uh, a child's offense to the father, you know, and, and uh, sinning against our father. And it's, it's an intimate family matter here. And uh, many think that the purpose of John is found in chapter 5 and verse 13 should be in the notes of the extra verses. And uh, these things have I written unto you that you believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So we know it's written to believers to give us that assurance of eternal life and uh, the assurance of faith in Jesus Christ. Now, uh, another thing that was going on at that time the Gnostics were pretty big. They were pretty powerful. There was a, uh, it was to combat Gnosticism, which taught that the, the human body is evil, and uh, it, it has to get special treatment. And there were, there were two schools of thought at that time. It's, it's basically one of them was that we can discipline and control our body's appetites to more easily master the flesh. Or the other was just live any way you want eat, drink, and be merry, party it out, you know, and, and uh, just uh, take care of your spirit. So your spirit life is alive, but, you're, you know, what you do with your body, body doesn't matter that much. You can get a lot of people to join that club. <laughs> but uh, part of the Gnostic teaching was that Jesus wasn't a, really a man, but he's kind of like a phantom or a spirit, not really a, a, a guy. That's why John says, hey, look, I heard him. I saw him. I studied him. I, I touched him. Uh, John was often the guy that was found lying against Jesus' breast. He was a young boy then, teenager. And a lot of people think that they're safe and acceptable to God as long as they go to church. This is a church? This is a sanctuary in a warehouse, okay? And no stained glass here. But it's not the church that does it, it's Jesus Christ and God's Holy Spirit. As long as they say, well, if we go to church, or if I was baptized as an infant, I was. But I, later in life, I actually went into the water on my own. But uh, the other thing is, well, you know, if you keep up the church rituals, the, the church doctrines, and uh, we'll, we'll worship here and there, we'll go to church now and then. Uh, and I'm going to, you know, on a scale of good to bad, I'm going to have more good than bad. That'll, that'll get me there. So people will come in and out of church on Sunday and we can get lifted up. I, I get blessed by worship and, you know, of giving the word to God, hearing the word of God. 
But oftentimes we walk out of church and many will just do whatever they want during the week. And what, this kind of like behaving like a Gnostic. And, and God really wants seven day a week Christians. He wants us to, to worship him seven days. And it's interesting the way he started this letter, that which was from the beginning. What beginning? Well, if you were to just go past the index in your Bible, the first book in there is what? Genesis. What's the, what are the first words? In the beginning. In the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In John, in his gospel, in, in verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then verse uh, 14, the word, the logos, was made flesh and dwelt among us. The, the, we, had, we take that word logos, it's a Greek word, and we turn it into logo. Whenever you see a logo, you know there's a lot more behind it. When you see that, you, know, you see that big Google G, you know there's more behind it. Remember that we all are familiar with Kodak here. Uh, the, the K, they didn't make Ks. There was more behind it. A logo is something that represents a whole bunch more behind that logo. So Jesus is more than just a word. He's a manifestation of God. And in 1 John 1, 1, we see here that which was from the beginning. Well, now we know what beginning. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That beginning, Jesus was already here. In that beginning, that's the beginning, the beginning of the Bible, the beginning of time. Jesus was here. And who was it? It was Jesus. That which was from the beginning. Jesus Christ, in his divine nature as the everlasting Jehovah, the eternal I am, the Logos, as he says here, which was and is and is to come. We're stuck in time. It's what? Sometime past 10 on a Sunday morning on the 13th of was it February? <laughs> We're stuck in time. God is outside of time. He just sees this whole parade of life all at once. Well, I read that thing last week about one thought in God. And it says he existed from the beginning. That means before Genesis 1-1, before the prophets, before Abraham, before Adam even, before all of creation, before even time was created, because God created time. The reason we have watches is to measure time, which is a creation from God, because he's outside of time. What does that mean? I don't know, but I believe it. <laughs> I know we'll be there one time. He was here before time began. He was here before the creation of the world. He, he's the maker of all things, says even from everlasting. That Jesus, from the beginning, and Paul, or I'm sorry, John is saying, that's the one which we've heard we heard him teaching. We heard him speaking in the synagogues, in, in the temples, on the hillside, on the mountaintops. He would teach from a boat, get everybody on the shoreline. He'd teach there. He'd go into Christian homes. He'd go into Gentile homes. He'd go wherever he could be heard. We had private conversations with him. He's not the spirit. He's a real thing. Also heard a voice from heaven uh, declaring him to be the, the son of God at his baptism. Also, at the transfiguration, God actually spoke to this word of God. He says, we've seen it with our eyes. And they saw him daily walking with them, the 12 of which John was one. They saw him in his human nature, that one from the beginning of time, who stepped into time for a 33-year period and then stepped back out again and went up and, to be with the Father. And he did the normal things of life. Uh, just like they did. He ate, he drank, he walked, he talked. He wasn't the spirit, he was the real thing. Not only that, he did a, a lot of miracles. He raised people from the dead, he cleansed lepers, he restored sight to the blind, he restored hearing to the deaf. They called them dumb. Dumb didn't mean stupid, it meant you can't hear. Or you can't speak, I'm sorry. So he, he made the deaf to hear, and, uh, and he was transfigured on the mountain, it was glorious. So they saw him in his glory, and they also saw him hanging on the cross. You don't nail a spirit to the cross. In fact, God had to come into to, to time as a human in a form that could, could be nailed to the cross to take the punishment for our sins. They saw him on the cross, 
bleeding there, dying there. And then they saw him later resurrected from the dead and walking alive for 40 days amongst them, then rising into heaven. Can you imagine that being there? There he is. He's behind that cloud. Wait a minute. He just came out from behind that cloud. There he, he's, there he is. They watched him go up as the cloud finally took him out of their sight. So he says, which we've looked upon hundreds, thousands of times, seen his face. We know him closely. We know him intimately. They were able to recognize him from a distance. And he says, our hands have handled him. The word of life. Peter was walking on the water for a short time when Jesus said, come on, come on over here. Until he, his faith left him and he ended up catching Jesus by the hand as he was sinking in the water. And John the Apostle loved Jesus and he was the, the one that Jesus loved. He often leaned on Jesus' chest, as I said, as they would eat and drink, because they didn't sit around tables like we do. The Last Supper is more a modern rendition of how they ate. If you go to Israel, they will take you to a Bedouin's tent, and you'll, you'll lie down prone, and they'll serve food on the, in front of you on a, a mat. So they were often reclining when they were eating or resting. Thomas, after Jesus' resurrection, uh, he... We called him Doubting Thomas. Today, that's one of those colloquialisms we'll hear. And he's a Doubting Thomas. He doesn't believe things. He put his hand in Jesus' side. All the apostles were do, told to do the, the same, to know that it was Jesus and not a spirit. Real flesh and blood. Spirits don't, don't have flesh and bones. Jesus, who was once a spirit in eternity, also it says that he made all things, and without him was not anything made that was made. So he's the creator He's the author of life, the creator of time, matter, space. He became flesh to walk on earth as a man, as the mediator, also as the spotless lamb. God's revealed himself to mankind in, in, in different ways. In fact, in Romans 1, if you read through that, it says that those who, don't, basically paraphrasing, if you, don't, if you don't see God in the, this, you're without, you don't have an excuse. One of the ways he, he reveals himself to us is in the creation. You know what? It's getting harder and harder to be an atheist today. Uh, a guy named Briarly wrote a book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Because <laughs> what's happening is, that you look at the DNA helix. Look at the eyeball and all those connections in the brain and, and all the synapses in the brain and the wonderful things that go on. I mean, why do you need a heart? To pump blood. Well, where does, how do you get a heart and blood and veins and arteries and capillaries and all that all at once? You don't. How do you get it in sequence? You don't. <laughs> so uh, he's, uh, he's revealed himself in the creation. If you look into the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, the, the climactic uh, cycles that we see, all you see is order, the universe. We're still looking for the edge of the universe. It's so huge. Billions of galaxies with billions of stars each. It's mind-boggling. I remember once seeing a, a picture of a, a camera over a microscope looking at a little bacteria or an amoeba or a paramecium swimming around, and then it backs up over that uh, above the microscope, goes up to the ceiling, goes through the ceiling, up onto the roof, goes back up and shows the house, and then goes back up and, and eventually gets off into space, shows the Earth, and then the moon, and then the solar system, and then the galaxies, and, then, uh, and you know it just goes back and back and back. And you see the, the grandeur from microscopic to macroscopic. It's huge. <laughs> it's huge. So that's one of the ways God sh proves himself. You just look around you. If you can't see a creator in all that, you don't have an excuse. Because God says, I made it so wonderful, so amazing. Uh, I like to watch these nature programs that show things living like a mile below the uh, ocean uh, and all the different f fish. So we're just, hey, we've just discovered a lot of those in the last hundred years because they've been so deep we haven't been able to see them. They're awesome. Well, anyway, so that's one. Don't want to get too far off in that. Another way, way he's... Uh, shown himself is in the word here's a book written what over a course of 4,000 years 66 books uh, over 40 authors and all one message system how do you do that well we don't god does so he's revealed himself in a creation he's revealed himself in the bible in the word of god and he's also revealed himself in the word of god jesus christ god's son 
who came and he walked on this earth for 33 years and he did all those things I mentioned earlier. In fact, in John 14, verse 9, Jesus said, He that's seen me has seen the Father. In other words, Jesus is God's revelation of God himself. He's got a very special name in 1 John 1, 1. He's called the Word of Life. And we we look at Jesus' eternal existence. You know, we have, like I said, these 66 books. Much of the Old Testament is prophetic, pointing toward Jesus. Micah 5.2, it should be in the notes, is declared in Micah 5.2, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler of his, in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting, like in the beginning, out of Bethlehem would come to be a ruler, spiritual ruler, whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. I mean, Jesus has always been. He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, all of these things. I guess we better move on. Verse 3 and 4. That which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and that truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write unto you, <clears throat> that your joy, <coughs> pardon me, your joy may be full. <clears throat> so Jesus came so that we might have fellowship with God the Father, his Son, Jesus Christ, and with one another. If we had each, If each of us came up here and told their story, you'd find out how diverse and how different uh, we really are. Except we have one thing in common, which is the Lord Jesus. And uh, we can have an, not only a, an intimate relationship spiritually with one another as friends, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can also have an intimate relationship with God. That was a revolutionary uh, thought in those days. Uh, Jesus spoke to the Jews about that kind of a relationship when he told them to call God Father. He said, pray in this manner, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Who hasn't prayed that? I used to pray it on beads when I was a Catholic. John tells us who this being is, the eternally existent one, a physically present, word of life, God the Son, distinct from the Father. Yet part of the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose name is Jesus, who is the Christ, the Christos, uh, the Messiah. And when we have fellowship with him, we have fullness of joy based on who God is, not based on circumstances. Oh, this is a bad day. <laughs> or, or our performance. In only four verses here, John has established the eternal God who was from the beginning who was before all things, who has physically come to earth from that out-of-time zone into the time zone, is seen by John and others. They're, they're all eyewitnesses. This God is the word of life, the Logos, or as we think of him, the Logo of God. This God is the Son of God the Father. This God is distinct, though, from God the Father and from the Holy Spirit. And we can have fellowship with this God. In fact, we can talk to him anytime we want. We can have fellowship with God's people. I mean, I learned a lot of uh, pre-programmed and written down prayers years ago. But I don't need that. I pray to God my heart, what's going on inside. We can come straight to the throne of God, find grace and, need, and help in need. Uh, verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him. And we declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So part of getting to know God and having fellowship with him is realizing that he is sinless perfection. And we're not. <laughs> we're not. And if we have a problem with our fellowship with God, it's really our problem, not his. I mean, he, he accepts it, and he died for, for those sins, and think about this. If you don't feel close to God today, who moved? <laughs> think about it. Who moved? Whenever I get the, you know, the weepies say, Lord, I doesn't feel like you're with me. You know, who moved? I'm the one that moved. It's my heart that moved. He has no sin or darkness, it says. He's sinlessly perfect. So the idea here is that sin is darkness, God is light, 
For there to be darkness, there has to be an absence of light. That's what darkness is. And God himself is light. And light has no darkness in it. When we approach fellowship with our God, we can assume, we must assume from the beginning, that God's never wrong. If there's a problem, who's it with? His creation. (laughs) Us. Because we think we know it all. Not you guys. The guys on the other side of the canal. So, So, sin is in God's creation, but sin is not in him. He's the creator. He's sinless perfection. Verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But... If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So the idea here is if if sin is darkness and we sin, I guess we're walking in darkness at that moment, aren't we? If we walk in darkness or sin, we can't have fellowship with God at that time because he's only light. He's only sinless perfection. If we talk about how godly we are while we're in sin, he says, we're lying. We deceive ourselves. If we talk about how close we are to God while we're in sin, we're lying. We can't be in sin and close to God at the same time. And when John speaks of walking in darkness, he means a pattern of life, a pattern of living, an unrepentant sinful lifestyle not an occasional step into sin. I I would say fall into sin. We usually don't fall into it. We usually walk in with our eyes open. But uh, as Christians, we do sin. And it does cause a temporary break in fellowship with God, I think. But our lifestyle can't be a total walk in darkness. We can't be living in sin, rejecting God and his wisdom, because he's always right, remember. A continual lifestyle of sin we can't do those things and claim fellowship with God. But here's the blessing of, of, of walking in the light with him. If we will walk with God, have fellowship with him in our lives, walk after his way, stay in his word, pray and seek his will, we'll have fellowship not only with him but with one another. We'll jo- enjoy that continual cleansing of Jesus. And that's one of the things that, if you haven't read Calvary Road by Roy Hessian, do that. It's a good little, it's a little pocket book, just a little thing. But it has to do with that continual presence before God and say, oh, Lord, I just did that. I sinned again. Please forgive me. We don't have to collect them all up till Saturday to dump them all out on a priest or someone. We can just go to our our Savior. And even though we all sin and come short of the glory of God, that's Romans 3.23, this continual cleansing is ours by the blood of Jesus. His death in our place, him getting what we deserved, the wrath of God being poured out on him, the son of God, he endured it on behalf of all believers in him. He really endured it for all the whole world, but only those, it only works to those who come to him. His blood paid for all the sins past, present, and future. Wow. It wasn't a lot of blood. He was a man, pints, but he paid for it all. Now verses... uh, 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, this is a great verse to memorize. If we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just. In other words, pure justice. Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. We make him a liar and his word is not in us. Oh, man. Sometimes we don't struggle as much with the verses in the Bible that we don't understand as much as we struggle with the words, the verses that we do understand. (laughs) And here John speaks of the presence of sin, the confession of sin, and the cleansing from sin. He's not saying that we're walking around sinlessly perfect. We know better. We've, a lot of us here have been together for, for a number of years, and we know we're sinners saved by God's grace. Because sinless perfection is only found in Jesus, in, in God himself. And a lot of people think, well, they're, they're so spiritual that the Bible doesn't apply to them. They understand enough. They don't need forgiveness. 
they they say that their their fellowship with God is so close, they're so spiritual that they're above God's commands. No, I'm just kind of walking in the spirit all the time. I've met people like that. You know, and the mosquito would fly by. Oh, I don't want to kill one of God's creatures. And I go, <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> so some think that though sin is present, it doesn't really hinder their fellowship with God. It's not true. The word of God doesn't say that. John's saying if a con Condition of unrepentant sin is present. You have no fellowship with God, even if you think you do. You deceive yourself. <clears throat> and uh, self-deception is a terrible thing. It's, it's kind of dealing with an area of ignorance that we don't even know we're ignorant in. And that's what ignorance is. But uh, there was a lady who said she was a school teacher. She lost her life savings in a business scheme that had been elaborately explained by a swindler that she would become rich, of course. When her investment disappeared and her dream was shattered, she went to the Better Business Bureau. Why on earth, he said, didn't you come to us first? Didn't you know about the Better Business Bureau? Here's her answer. Oh, yes, I knew about you. I've always known about you. But I didn't come because I, would afraid you, I was afraid you'd tell me not to do it, not to make that investment. The, the folly of human nature is that even though we know where the answers lie, and it's in the Word of God. I remember somebody stumped me once and said, oh, every answer is in there? What time is it? At the time, I went, oh, I guess you got me. And I said, no, it's, it's time to repent. It's what time it is. You know? I, you know, I, I often think of the right answer a day or two later. I'm a little slow to respond, you understand. But... <laughs> We know where the answer lies. It's in God's word. But we don't turn there for fear of what it might say. And I don't know about you. We, you know, I, Early on, I'd go through and highlight things. And then I'd come to verses where I wanted to get the black marker. <laughs> oh, no, I don't want those over there. <laughs> but we have to get to the point where we just believe it all. We understand it all. And some of it hurts more than others. That's all. Um, John 9.31 says, Now we know that God hears not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, him he hears. And the Bible says we can't even know our own heart. Can we truly deceive ourselves? Have you not memorized Jeremiah 17, 9 yet? The heart is, you know, oh, think of all these movies that say, follow your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We can deceive ourselves. You mean like, I could deceive myself, my heart? If I follow my heart, it could deceive me? Yeah, <laughs> you bet. Because the heart is like a roller coaster. If you've been on the jackrabbit at Seabreeze, you know it's fast and it goes up and down. We can deceive ourselves. Cleansing of sin comes as we confess our sins to God and ask his forgiveness. When we confess our sin, it means we believe what God says about our sin. He will forgive us. He's, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But when we sin, that fellowship is broken and needs to be restored. I, I like the Psalms of David are, are incredible. It's David, after his adultery with Bathsheba, remember the story about Bathsheba taking a bath and he viewed and called her in and they ended up having a child together and all. He recognized he, in, in Psalm 51, verse 2 through the first part of 4, Wash me thoroughly, in other words, through and through or thoroughly, from my iniquity, my guilt. Cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. So we know that every sin may be sinning against a person, but it's also sinning against God. And that idea of, he's, he's saying, I understand my guilt, it's there before me. Jesus took all your sins. When you come to faith in him, you're clean. He sees us as righteous. He sees us white as snow. And we know we're not. The devil will want to bring up our past. And that's where it should be, in the rearview mirror that's been taped over that mirror. And notice that in verse 9 that confess. It's a verb. It's a, it's a verb of action. It's in the present tense. It means that we should be continually confessing our sins, not necessarily to one another or to, the, to a priest or but to the Lord. Keep confessing as they happen. It keeps a relationship of going with the Lord, a conversation. Salvation happens once. 
I remember the moment, still remember, 4th of July, 7 a.m., 1985. <laughs> I prayed, and that was, that was changed forever from that moment on. That's another story. But uh, confession, cleansing, restoring fellowship with the Lord, that happens all the time. That goes on. That's a continual thing. Sanctification, which is being set apart for God, that happens the moment we're saved. But it's a continual process because you understand the more you read the Word of God, the more you listen to the Word of God, the more you get sanctified and set apart to His His work. And and it's it's actually impossible to know and confess every sin we ever commit. Why? Because we're so deceived, we don't even know every sin that we commit. And God is so pure and perfect, it's easy to commit <laughs> sins. We're, we're, be, we're, we're forgiven because our punishment was put upon Jesus. We're cleansed by his blood. That's what the Bible says. And we're kept in continual fellowship with him by continual confession of the sins we know about, at least. I mean, Jesus covered them all. But uh, And as God convicts us of any sin that hinders our fellowship with him, we should just simply confess it, get it done with, he, he knows it already. You think that God says, I want you to pray because he doesn't know what we're going to pray? No, it's not that at all. He knows everything from the beginning to the end. He does it for our sake. But when we confess it, he gives us cleansing and forgiveness. And then our walk with the Lord, our fellowship with the Lord continues without hindrance. It's a really sweet thing. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin God is being faithful and just to forgive us our sins because of Jesus. And God's promise in verse 9, be careful. It shouldn't lead us into sin. Well, you know, God's going to forgive me anyway, so I can get away with this. That's not the idea. In fact, in Romans, it should be in those extra notes. In chapter 6 of Romans, the first four verses, there were people that were saying, this is another easy club to get people to join. This is, the, you know, God, he's a forgiving God, so let's give him more opportunity to exercise his grace by sinning. And then people would just, they would flock to that club. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in. Paul addressed that. He says, what shall we say then? Shall, shall we sin, shall we continue in sin, sin that grace may abound? In other words, the more I sin, the more God gets to pour his grace out. Oh, let's bless God. <laughs> God forbid, there's his answer, God forbid, how sh shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Wow. So, yeah, don't be tempted to help God pour his grace out. He's got plenty to pour out on us already. Uh, it's, our mercies are new every morning because we need it. That's when we don't get what we deserve. Grace is getting something we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. So God's promises should lead us away from sin. Saying, hey, you know what? God forgave me. And he keeps forgiving me. He keeps showing me. That he's long-suffering and merciful and gracious and forgiving. And, and the wrath that we deserve was poured out already on Jesus Christ on the cross. As he hung on that cross and he said in, in Matthew 27, 46, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus said, it is finished, Remember that? That was his last words on the cross. It is finished. It was tetelestai. Tetelestai means paid in full. That was what they'd write across a, a mortgage or a bill when somebody paid it in full. Tetelestai. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And when he said that, but when he said it is finished, that was tetelestai. means paid in full. I've paid in full, Father. The sins of all mankind as he hung there on the cross. So, so Sin is always present in the world today, you think? <laughs> to rob our fellowship with God. But don't forget the remedy. Confession. Confess our sins. He's faithful and just. It's one of those if-then statements. Computer programmers know those. If you do this, I'll do this. If we confess, he will forgive and cleanse. There's a story about hiding. 
You may remember, uh, if you follow boxing, you know, we remember Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson or some of the more recent ones. But back years ago, Joe Lewis, he was a world heavyweight boxing champion from 1937 until 1949. In 1946, Joe Lewis was preparing to defend his title against a skilled fighter named Billy Kahn. Lewis was warned to watch out for Khan's great speed and his tactic of darting into attack and then moving quickly out of his opponent's range. In a famous display of confidence, Lewis said, he can run, but he can't hide. <laughs> Many deny the light of God's word, as we learn today, and they don't want to know God's truth. Rejecting the truth of God's word, hiding from the truth of God's word. Don't be one of those who runs and hides. It's like turning off the light of God's word when we don't like what we see. In 2 Corinthians 4, 6, the Apostle Paul wrote, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But here's a verse that's not here, John three nineteen, And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The light of God's word will set us free. It does set us free. And it'll keep you in fellowship with him and from one, and with one another. Did I say from him? I meant with him. Let's stand and pray. Lord, it's with you that we desire to do all things, that we want to have fellowship, that we want to know you, the power for your resurrection, the fellowship of your suffering, and being made conformable unto your grace, Lord. So help us, Lord, to draw near to you each day, Lord. Our flesh wants to go on one way, and we know the Spirit uh, wants to go another, Lord. So help us in our unbelief, Lord. Help us in our weakness, Lord, because you are our strength. We just love you, Lord, and be with us this day as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.